ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Kira Westerway is back on Conversations today to tell you that giant apes once walked the earth. We don't know much about how these giant apes looked, but we do know they were huge. They roamed the earth when it looked like an entirely different planet, inhabited by entirely different primates, including this giant ape that's been named Gigantopithecus blackie, or Giganto for short. But despite its size, Giganto didn't leave many clues behind when it became extinct. Kira is a geochronologist and associate professor at the School of Natural Sciences at Macquarie University. Kira and her team reconstruct and date the remains of early humans and other primates to find out all kinds of things about how and when they lived and how and why they died. And for the past 10 years, Kira has been part of a team trying to solve the mystery of Giganto, the giant prehistoric ape. Hi, Kira. Hi. The story of Giganto starts on a day in 1935 in Hong Kong. Tell me what happened on that day. So there's a German paleontologist called von Konitzwald and he was poking around in a drugstore in Hong Kong, traditional sort of Chinese medicines, and he found a tooth labelled dragon tooth. And he obviously had a knowledge of primates um, and he looked at that tooth and realised it wasn't a dragon. (laughs) Not that we know what a dragon (laughs) tooth looks like. Uh, But he realised it was a primate and so obviously he bought the tooth and um, took it away and studied it and realised that it's it's a very, very large primate, um, which he named Gigantopithecus blackie. And how big would this tooth be compared to, I don't know, one of your teeth? Um, pretty big. Usually people say to me, oh, but how do you know how big it was? But if you compare it with a normal human tooth, I mean, I've got a, a reconstruction of the mandible, the jawbone, and when you compare it, it, it's massive. I mean, the mandible comes out double the size of, you know, our mandibles. So, so what did early paleontologists think this bone and this tooth might be? So they they always knew it was a primate. Um, they were just sort of unsure as to where it kind of fitted in, in, in there. Was it more like a gorilla, like a large gorilla, kind of a King Kong type gorilla? Or was it more related to um, orangutans? So looked um, more like uh, the modern day orangutan that we know. So at that time, there was a lot of debate over where it sat in the family tree. That's since been rectified because they did some protein analysis, looking at sort of what we call paleoprotein or early proteins, and that placed it in the orangutan family tree, so an early offshoot of the orangutan family. Did they think for a while it could have just been one freakishly large orangutan or something like that? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a large orangutan. That's the closest kind of um, analogy we have um, for what it looked like. For a long time, people kind of did think it was more like a gorilla, more of a King Kong. But until we got that protein, that it kind of confirmed what most people believe, that it, it is actually related to an orangutan. And, and how long before more fossils of this type were found? Yes, it wasn't until the 1960s um, that two Chinese paleontologists were digging around in some of the caves in, in southern China, and they found a cave called Dashin, very high up. We've actually been back to that cave. And they found in situ, so in the sediments, they found giganto teeth. So that's the first time we'd actually found it in the sediments. And the difference between finding something in sediments and finding it in a drugstore... Being sold as dragon's teeth. Yeah, exactly. ...is huge because you have context. Straight away, you can date it because although you could date a tooth in a drugstore, you actually need the surrounding sediments to be able to date it properly. Um, So you need the sediments around it. We have a context. We have a a sediment. We can also look at the the animals that were living at the same time as Giganto. So that's what I mean by a context. Do you know what I mean? So straight away, we can start to work out how it lived and when it was around. And how were you drawn into the mystery of Giganto the Giant Ape, Kira? So I was uh, presenting at a conference in Siam Reap in uh, Cambodia and a colleague of mine, Russ uh, Shahorn from Iowa University in, in the States, he saw how I had put together a chronology for one of the sites, the Lead Asia in Sumatra, and he really liked how I'd put that chronology together. So he invited me to come to China with his colleague Ying Chi Zhang from the IVPP in Beijing. Um, and we went out, this is 2015, and we went out and had a look at some of the sites. And I realised that there's lots of material there to date, and it's a really exciting story. And it's something that 
can be answered by timing. So timing is really, really essential. I love questions that get answered by timing. <laughs> so how do you time, how do you age, uh, uh, figure out the age of uh, an ancient fossil like that? Is this carbon dating or we have much more sophisticated methods now or something? Yeah, going? I mean, carbon dating is can be incredibly useful. Obviously, it was an organism that was alive and died. But the problem with carbon-14 dating is that it really has an upper level of about 40,000. And we knew from, you know, sort of early estimations that it was going to be a lot older than that. So come 14, unfortunately, stops being useful about 40, 50,000. And then we start getting into dating techniques such as uranium series, which is looking at flowstones, which is that secondary carbonate rock, and also luminescence dating. And obviously luminescence is, is what I do. And how far <laughs> can that take you back? So it really depends on the natural radiation in the soil, because when we look at luminescence, we look at how much signal has accumulated over time. It's a light sensitive technique. Um, and then we divide that by the natural radiation in the soil. So if the natural radiation of the soil is quite high, then it limits how far you can actually go back. Unfortunately, China has very high natural uh, radiation in the soil, um, which means I could just about get back to about 300,000, but I knew that would be enough to, to look at uh, Giganto's extinction. Oh, that's really old then. Yeah. We're going back that far. Yeah, definitely. When you were looking at the sites where these teeth and mandibles had been found, what were some of the larger questions floating around your mind? So there were two really big questions with Giganto that have not been really established. And this is why it's such an enigma in, in paleontology, because we only have teeth, probably about 3,000 teeth, and four parts of a jawbone or mandible. That's all we know about this species. And it was around for nearly 2 million years. So that's a huge amount of time to not know that much about the species. But the two big questions are, what did it look like? And the only way we can find that out is by finding anything from the neck down, which we call postcranials. And then the other big question is, when and why did it go extinct? Now, finding postcranials is just about searching as much as you can, just looking everywhere. And we already were doing that. But the other big question, obviously, about the extinction is something that we could address. And that's why I was brought on board as a geochronologist, because then I can really help with the aspect of timing. So this meant there was a hunt through the caves of south southern China to look for more fossils to see if you can find these other bones that belong to this giant ape? Yeah, so we just started searching. Um, Ying Chi Zhang from IVP had already found about six caves that had uh, giganto evidence. So we went and dated those and collected samples. But then we we're also looking for more. Always, always looking for new evidence. <laughs> Everywhere we go, we're looking for new evidence all the time. We found a lot of caves that are earlier Giganto. So we know Giganto was around from about 2.3 million down to, we, th we thought, around 300,000, something like that. So oh, that's good, a long period yeah, of time. Yeah, two million years. And to only have teeth and bits of a jawbone from a species that was around for two million years, I mean, this is why, it, you know, it's... It's the holy grail. <laughs> yeah, and you're not looking for mouse bones either, are you? You're no. looking for bones that would Big be, bones. be, be ab absolutely huge. Yeah. Now, now, as you say, you're a geochronologist. You're not an archaeologist or, yep. an, or are you kind of a, a specialised anthropologist or something? What, what, do, what do you actually do? What's the actual discipline you're part of, Kira? Yeah, so it is geochronology, um, so dating. And I'm really into looking at things that require a timeline and require an accurate timeline to be able to answer the question. So obviously then I apply the, the results that I get to answer these big questions. We've been talking about this giant ape. How yeah. big are we talking about? So from a scaling factor of the size of the teeth and the size of the jawbone, we think probably it could stand about three metres tall. Ooh. So we're talking big, but it would have been an orangutan type primate. So it probably would have sat on the floor more than it would have stood. But if it stood, it would have been three metres, probably weighed about uh, 200 to 300 kilos. So, so that's almost not small. Like No, three metres tall. That's yeah. almost twice as tall as I am yeah. or thereabouts. That's massive. Very big. So if, it, if I was standing next to it, I'd come up to its just, just above its waist yeah. then or something. Yeah. Ooh. It's massive. Oh, that's massive. That's, that's really <laughs> gigantic intriguing. Gigantic by name, gigantic <laughs> by nature, definitely. Why do you think we are so intrigued by megafauna like that? I, I think what I think about Giganto is that it's like a, a, a massive thing that is part of our primate family. You know, other, other giants that we know, dinosaurs, woolly mammoths, they're not so related to us. This giant is in the primate family. So it's almost like... 
it's like ours, isn't it? You know, it's like it's in our primate family, very, very, very distant relative to humans, but it's part of our primate tree. So it's much more relatable to humans than any other giants that we can think of. So it's very intriguing. What can we intuit about how it looks? I mean, this is all guesswork at the moment, isn't it, really? But what do you imagine it would have looked like, just as a three-metre-high orangutan or something else? Yeah, I mean, we really don't know. That's that's the best that we have, the best scenario that we have at the moment. I mean, you may have seen with, with the Nature paper, we had a sort of a close-up of the face on the, the front cover, but we don't really know. I mean, we didn't give it orange fur because we just don't know if it did have that or not but closely related to to orangutans, so we kind of made it look a little bit orangutan-like. But again, we don't really know. Does it fit into that family tree of primates neatly, or is it just some strange gigantic offshoot from the family tree of primates that eventually lead up to us and the modern primates. Yeah, so so if you picture the family tr- uh, the the primate tree, orangutans are an early offshoot about 12 million years ago, um, and then you get gorillas and then you get chimpanzees and then you get humans. So this early offshoot of orangutans, Gigantopithecus would have been an offshoot off that before you get to modern day orangutans. You've been finding these fossils in southern China. Have they been found elsewhere or just around that region? So if you think about Gigantopithecus Pythicus Blackie, he would have been roaming um, these kind of dense forests and they wouldn't have known boundaries. So the boundary between China and Vietnam wouldn't have been there. I mean, they they could have just gone anywhere. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So there's no reason why they shouldn't be in places like northern Vietnam. There have been some claims for some sites that, that is giganto, but what we're finding is people say, oh, this is giganto, and then we go back and look, and identification-wise, it's actually not giganto, it's another primate. There's also another, um, what we call a mystery ape. There's an ape that hasn't really been identified yet, and that's where a lot of these teeth are, are being assigned. But every time people sort of claim, oh, you know, this is giganto, or this is giganto, we always go back and have a look, and it's either a misidentification or, or the, the timing is not right. So at the moment, there's definitely no overlap between humans and, and giganto and evidence that we found. I mean, we're talking about a big, long period of its existence here, what, two million years, yeah. I think you said. Yeah. I don't know if we can make generalisations like this, but can we imagine what the world looked like, that part of the world looked like during the lifetime, the larger part of the lifetime of this giant ape? Yeah, so in southern China at that time, around two million years ago, would have been very dense forest. We know that from the, the pollen reconstruction. And with sort of what we call a mosaic, so there would have been patches of grassland as well because we definitely see grassland fauna um, around at that time. Would have been like humid and jungle-like? Yeah, very very humid and jungle-like. Well, it's funny actually because it's like dense forest, so what we not really seasonal though, so sort of pretty much one environment at the time. And then as we shift to about 700 to 600,000, that's when we start to move into this strengthening of seasons and we get like a wet season and a dry season and then it would have got a lot more tropical. So if we are to imagine Giganto and the, the, these giant apes and their friends sitting about in the forest floor, we're imagining a very steamy, humid forest, maybe not a lot of natural light if it's that very dense. Yeah, they would have been on the, 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 the floor of the forest, definitely. They're way too big to go up in the trees. So compared to orangutan, they would have been sitting on the floor of the forest, whereas orangutans would have been up in the top canopy. So very, very different kind of lifestyle. So you found some of these, these these fossils were found in caves to begin with. Does that mean they lived in caves? No, definitely not. So they would have been way too big to go inside caves. So the caves that we are looking at are what we call wash-in caves. So if you imagine a limestone landscape, which what we call cast, that's just what we call limestone. As in Um, K-H-A-S-T. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, if you imagine that they form these very large towers and the landscape would have been at the same level, and it's forming caves all the way down. So as the landscape starts to erode down, you start to expose these big limestone towers, and each one would have had a cave um, around that, that level. And what's happening is everything on the landscape, any fossils or organisms, anything that dies is getting washed into these caves and then getting cemented within the sediments. And so the the oldest caves are the highest up on the towers and the youngest caves are are lower down. So there's one cave called Mula Mountain, very, very famous. Up the top, you've got evidence of Giganto about 2 million. And then as you go down, you get evidence of Giganto about 300,000. And then very close to the alluvial plain, you get a a cave about 100,000, which has got modern humans in it. So it's almost like, you know, you can see the whole timeline 
of events that's happened all in one mountain. It's crazy. That's just like the opposite of archaeology. Like when you go <laughs> yes. to when you go to Rome, the 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 ancient Forum, which is over two and a half thousand years old, that's at the lowest part yeah. of Rome because over time, yeah, sediment builds, builds up, up, silt builds up, and yeah. so street level Rome today is is meters above what it was in the Renaissance, and which is many yeah. meters above what it was exactly. during the ancient world. But this is just the opposite. This is the opposite of that. way around. Yeah, just because of the way that the landscape erodes down and exposes the caves. And they kind of form this kind of stepped pattern all the way down. So you've been given Mission Impossible, which is <laughs> in which the mission was, should you choose to accept it, and you did, which is to try and date these creatures and go looking for more bones as well. Yeah. Where did you start when you went caving in China, Kira? So we wanted to start with the dating because for us, if you're looking for when and why a, a species went extinct, if you don't have an accurate timeline, then you're looking for clues in the wrong places. And, and I'll give you a really good example of that. They originally thought that Gigantopithecus went extinct around 100,000. And at that time, we could see a deterioration of the forests. So they were like, okay, Giganto went extinct, the forests were deteriorating, that's what caused their extinction. But we now know that Giganto actually didn't go extinct at 100,000 much earlier, more like around 300,000. And the forest hadn't gone, hadn't started to deteriorate at that point. So straight away, that's not the cause of the extinction. So we started with timing just because we know we need to know exactly when it drops out the fossil record, and which I call the extinction window. So we wanted to establish a, a period of time which we were 100% sure, sure that Giganto disappeared from the fossil record. This so that's like, how we started. This is like police work, isn't yeah. it? Aren't you like look, looking for CSI. a missing person? Yeah. yeah you, you're, you're establishing the exact time, time to know death. where this yeah. specific ape was going to be at a certain, and who this ape was hanging around with, yeah. and where exactly <laughs> they were, what, what they were eating, what they were doing, bit, yeah. bit by bit. Yeah, very so much so. when you started going into this zone, these, this zone of caves, what's yeah. this region like? It's very hot. <laughs> it's very sweaty and wet. It's very, very dense jungle, uh, well, forested jungle. Some of it is quite um, rural, so there's a lot of agriculture and stuff. So you, you, sometimes you're going through rice paddies and, and other times you're with a machete and it's chop, 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 walk one step, chop, 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 walk another step. I mean, it's it's tough going. It's really hard going. And the cliffs are, are like this. And we've had a, we had one cave uh, that was 150 metres up and we had to climb up to it every day and then abseil down every evening. <laughs> and and the, the dedication of getting all of the paleontologists up there every day to excavate. And, and the conditions are, are pretty bad. <laughs> like it's, you're in a tiny, tiny cave and it's very hot and wet and sweaty and and you're excavating out the fossils. But we found, from that cave, we found hundreds of giganto teeth. So it was definitely worth it. <laughs> when you say you're going through caves, we're talking about like 10, 100, or, or what kind of, how, what, how many caves are actually in this region? Yeah, thousands. I mean, we, oh. we know, we're scratching the surface, really are. I mean, if you drive through the, the area, there's, a, there's a, like a highway all the way through, you can see caves from the roads. And those caves, I would say, you know, have definitely had human, humans in them, had people in them. Locals go in them sometimes looking for bird nests and, and guano and stuff, although not as bad as in Southeast Asia. But then you go more into the dense sort of towering cast and you go into caves, you know, no one has ever been in these caves before. You know, like, Normally, if people have been in there, there's a little bit of rubbish or there's some, some evidence of a fire or something. You know, you know, people have been in there. But some of them, yeah, no, you, you know you've, you're the only one that's been in there, which is a pretty cool feeling. Kira, how do the Chinese authorities feel about an Australian woman going about with a machete <laughs> and a whole lot of equipment going looking through giant caves for remnants of a giant ape? Are they, are they okay with all that? I mean, I think they're okay because obviously we did it through the IVPP in, in Beijing. So all the permissions were there. Um, I think it was a little bit challenging for my Chinese colleague because the area that we're working, Chongzhua in, in southern China, is very, very close to the Vietnamese border. And the Chinese don't really like anything too close to the border. And they certainly don't like foreigners coming down and seeing what goes on on the border. Um, so I wasn't really party to it, but I know that he had lots of visits from the local police. They came up to his hotel room and gave him stern chats about, is it wise to be working with Westerners? Wow. <laughs> so he had a lot, he had a lot to deal with. He kept us sort of protected from all of that. But yeah, no, everyone was, I mean, the locals are fantastic. They're, they're great. You know, we really worked well with them. But yeah, there are there are definitely political challenges, um, and then obviously, COVID hit, <laughs> and then everything just went haywire after that. So before COVID hit, though, you've got this plan to 
investigate what you're saying are thousands of caves? How do you even do that? Yeah, so I would say we, we probably looked about a couple of hundred. And the way we did that was we were pretty savvy straight away and we uh, hooked up with a group called Beijing Cavers and they came down with us. So every time we had a trip, we employed them, just go caving, just go caving, <laughs> just find caves. And, and that's what, literally what they did. They just went around the landscape. We trained them what a fossil looks like. We trained them what a breccia, which is like the sediment that contains fossils, um, look like. So they were really experienced um, and they knew exactly what a gigantotooth looked like. And they could probably do four or five caves in a day. Whereas that for us, you know, we could do one cave a day because <laughs> we're so much slower. So I wasn't allowed to go with the caving team because I slowed them down too much. But they would go everywhere and they'd come back with a report at the end of the day of what they found and then we would go back and assess excavation potential of some of the caves. So we've looked at hundreds of caves. We chose 22 of them to actually work on for looking at giganto evidence. Are there dangers in going into those caves? General sort of dangers of caving. I think most of the time it's the climbing abseiling that presents the, the biggest dangers. Some of them are, are, are walk-in caves so you can it's pretty steep getting up there, but once you get up there, you can just walk straight in and that's no problem. Others, like the one I was talking about earlier, that's, um, yeah, that was much more of a challenge. Oh, really? I, I just assumed they were all walk-in caves. What, what are, no, really? some of them are climb, climbing caves with proper climbing equipment and abseiling down again. And, and wriggle through yeah. caves, that sort of thing? Oh, there's lots of those, yeah. <laughs> lots of very, very small spaces. The, the, the fossils are usually in what we call a breccia, which is like a really cemented, um, sedimentary deposit with, it's got lots of rocks in it, but lots of fossils as well. And usually they're in really, sometimes they're on the cave roof or cave walls, but sometimes in really confined little spaces. So you have to get in there to really have a look. There are all these places along, I believe anyway, along the Great Australian Bight, which uh, these, these network of caves along the land there, yeah. which have been full of prehistoric animal fossils because they've mm. formed a kind of a trap. You, you fall yeah. into them. Are there caves like that? And, and are you looking in those places, those kind of unexpected pits that, yes. that Giganto might have stumbled into? Definitely. I think that the, the, what we call the pitfall traps, like they... They're really useful because on the landscape, we get you get a lot of collapsed cave structures. So do you remember I was saying that they're like almost stacked on top of each other, the caves, um, and they're all connected. And what happens is as the um, landscape starts to erode down, these caves can sometimes collapse in and just leave a big hole. So any unsuspecting giganto or any other fauna walking along can fall in. And if they do, then you get the complete skeleton, which is, which is fantastic. So those are the ones we look for. And the way we look for those is, I mean, you can't just walk around and find them. It's just too dense to do that. So we used a lot of drones to really do all the looking for us. And what's really good about the, the, the pitfall traps is that as you're flying over, you don't really see like a hole or anything, but the vegetation is different because it's grown later. So it's, it's collapsed down and then new vegetation has grown in and it's a different colour. So as you're flying over with the drone, you can spot these traps um, and then we sort of work out which ones we think would still have sediment in them and go back and have a look. So really your fondest dream is that you'd find one of these death traps yeah. and at the bottom there'd be an intact, a, a large, almost full skeleton amazing? of one of these <laughs> giant apes. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't have, that be amazing? You've not found that? No, we have not found that. One sort of thing you have to think about about this is we don't know what Giganto would look like. So the actual postcranial that we're looking for, we don't know what, what it would look like. What do you mean like. by postcranial? So postcranial is anything from the neck down. From the so neck down. So anything like right. an arm bone or a leg bone. We don't actually know what it would look like. So if we found something that we don't know what it is, we'd have to look at the sort of the, the size ranges of what we know. So we'd have to go through all the primates. Um, we found at one point a, a finger bone and we got very, very excited. It was very large and it was quite curved. And we were like, oh, but then we looked and it's actually within the range of a very large orangutan. So what we'd have to do is find something that was large enough to be outside the range of the, the primates that we know in that area. And then we can say, this could potentially be giganto. But you're, you're looking for something that you don't know what it looks like. <laughs> so it's it's really difficult. I mean, if I was looking for ancient orangutan, I know what orangutan would look like, so I know how to look for it. But if you're looking for something you don't know what it looks like, all you're going on is, is it outside the range of what we already know? Does that mean it's impossible to make a positive ID? Or once you have this bone that putatively could be an arm bone or whatever belonging to Giganto, are you able to... to 
definitively link it to these these teeth and these mandibles you found. Yeah, so it really depends on the state of preservation and how, how much of the bone we actually have. I mean, the chances are we're not going to find a full, complete bone. But from a diagnostic perspective, like trying to identify what it is, you know, if it's a fragment of a bone... We can't tell it from just by looking at the morphology of it. We can't tell whether that would be giganto bone. But there are other things that we can do. And there's a technique called zooms, which is just looking at the ancient DNA in the bone and we can identify, or, or proteins, and we can actually identify whether or not it's giganto because we actually have extracted the giganto protein. So we kind of know what we're looking for with that. So it would be a case of finding a cave with loads and loads of bones Totally can't tell what they are, just bone fragments, and then going through thousands of these bones and identifying which one this is an actual giganto bone, even though we can't tell what it is or what it's just a fragment, but at least to know this is a giganto bone. I mean, this is what they did in the Denisovan cave. Um, They identified another fairly large number of of, um, bones based on uh, Denisovan bones based on this technique. And yet for all of this you've not found these bones from below the neck. Podcast, broadcast, and online. Conversations with Richard Feidler. Now, you said you had launched this big inquiry into these caves, these thousands of caves throughout southern China, and then COVID hit. And that meant you had to go into the world of virtual reality. How did you do that, Kira? <laughs> so we were actually in China at that time. Obviously, we didn't know about it, but we just left and it was fine. Um, and then 2020 came and obviously everything just got locked down. We were in the middle of the project. There were times when obviously Beijing was locked down, so my colleague uh, Ying Chi couldn't really do anything, but there were periods when China opened up again, but obviously we couldn't go back there. Now, while we were working previously, not we didn't know about COVID happening, obviously, but we had started um, sort of documenting the caves and making models. And the reason we did that is because we had visited so many, I can't keep them all in my head. People say to me, oh, what about this cave? What about that cave? And I couldn't keep them straight in my head. So I'm like, I'm going to have to document them. And what I find, I find photos very um, unsatisfactory because you take the photos of what you think will be useful and then you get back and you're like, oh, I wish I'd done it from that angle. I wish I'd done this angle. And and so I, I thought, let's, let's make some models. So we do this technique called photogrammetry. And all it is, is just taking loads and loads of photos, but you do it very systematically. So you will sort of angle and then take a photo and then move a few centimetres and then take another photo and then and you just keep doing it like that um, and in this one area that you want to look at and then you stitch it all together with a very high-powered computer and it creates a 3D model. And we created these 3D models and, and put them on a platform so we could look at them and then a colleague of mine said to me, we can do this in VR if you want to. And I was like, yeah, great. So we put the VR headsets on. And oh, really? You got the goggles on and everything? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and he invited me down to come and have a look and I put this Google set on and I was back in that cave in China. I, I couldn't believe how realistic it was. Can you walk around then in yeah, this virtual you could, cave? Well, you can move around and you can look up and you can, yeah, do what you want. So I made, I made them very uh, interactive so that you can, um, you can kind of fire lasers at the wall. And so I use it in my teaching a lot because I, uh, students get to understand caves and stratigraphy <laughs> and sediments and stuff, um, which is really cool. But then we realized that we had this really valuable resource because once COVID hit and I couldn't go back there, I mean, Ying Chi was talking to me about certain caves and I'm like, hey, let's, let's, let's get really like nerdy and get it has a, sort of a VR hookup. And so we were talking on Skype or Zoom or something, but we were both in VR at the same time. So you're having a meeting in this virtual in, cave. Yeah, literally. That's very cool. And, and so I could talk about uh, the sediments and, and where I'd collected samples from and the, the ages of these. Um, and we could talk about where we're going to excavate next and just a really cool way of, uh, of getting past the problems with COVID. So you said there were two big mysteries with Giganto, the, yeah. the giant ape. The first one was why are we not finding other fossils? Why, what does it look like and why can't mm. we find the other fossils other than mandibles yeah. and teeth? Why? What's, do you have any inkling now of why it's been 
impossible to find other bones that ought to be very obvious and very, mm. very large lying around in the same places you've been finding these teeth. It's a really strange mystery. I mean, we've looked at hundreds of caves and all of these caves are really dominated by teeth. Now, it's not just giganto teeth. There's other faunal teeth as well. And we're not finding bones of those fauna either. So it's not just a giganto issue. It's literally there just aren't many bones. Now, out of those hundreds of caves that we looked at, we found three that have a lot of bones in them. Um, there's three out of 100. It's, it's not very much. And what we're finding is it's just particular caves that seem to um, have an accumulation of bone and others just have teeth. Now, people have said to me, oh, the bone's weathering. So you're only getting preservation of teeth and not. But the problem with that is we've looked, we've done a real microanalysis of the sediments and we're not finding broken down bone in the sediments in the same rate that you would expect if all of the bones are weathering. So I think there's, there's other issues in there. I think it's something to do with the fact that um, as we know that the sediments on the outside are, are, are channeling into this cave through what we call fissures, like little holes. And I'm just thinking that some of these fissures are very, very small. So they're letting through teeth but the bones are, are getting shut out. Like a sieve. Yeah, almost like a sieve. And, and, and so certain caves where we do find bone, um, that's just the fissures are much larger, so bones are coming in. And not only are we fi we're finding bones of other fauna, um, so potentially if we find a cave that has bones, there's no reason why there wouldn't be giganto bones in there as well. The problem that we found is the three bones we found with, uh, three caves we found with bone are all on the younger end. So they, they're they sort of like 200,000 or 250,000. They're just not old enough to have that giganto evidence. Is it possible, and this might be a really stupid question, Kira, because I don't really know how edible bones are. Is this possible that something's been eating these bones? I mean, we know that porcupines certainly do grab... They do? They do. They grab teeth and they grab bones and they like to gnaw on them um, because that's how they build up their calcium levels from gnawing on bones and teeth. Um, but I don't think that there's enough porcupines to eat all of those <laughs> bones. Um, but we definitely think that a lot of the bone accumulations we find in caves are, are actually porcupines dragging them in and, um, and, and using them in their lairs. So we do see that, but there's, that's not enough to explain the lack of bone. The second great mystery was how and why did they become extinct? What, 300,000 years ago, I think you said? Yeah, so 295 to 215,000. That's our little window of extinction. That doesn't seem very long, actually, does it? That window yeah. of extinction. Where do you start when you try to figure out an answer to why this gigantic ape became extinct? Presumably, it wouldn't have much trouble getting its way. I mean, with that size, like yeah. the larger dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, where did you start? So, like I said before, we started with dating. Um, that was the, the key component for us. Exactly when did it go extinct? And once we knew that, then we can start looking at what was going on in the environment at the time. So then we started looking at pollen. We looked at other fauna to see sort of what environments they were living in. Um, we looked at a microanalysis of the sediment. So really looking at um, what's going on in the sediment to give us clues. You mean where you found these teeth? Yeah, the where we found the teeth. It. And you yeah. found like pollen in, in that sediment just around yeah, the so teeth? Yeah, so pollen in the sediments. Right. There isn't very good environmental record in these areas. There's pollen records from, you know, deep sea cores miles off the coast, uh, but nothing really from that area. There's no real lakes where we can do this kind of stuff. And um, even though it's quite old, 300,000 up to 2 million, we're still finding pollen grains, even in the sediments that are 2 million years old, which is just testified to how amazing pollen grains are and how, you know, how good they are at surviving. Um, so from that, we could reconstruct exactly what the vegetation was doing and then how obviously the other fauna were responding to potential changes in this area. And the final step that we went, which a lot of people don't tend to go to when you're looking at extinction, they look at timing and they look at environment. But we went a step further and looked at behaviour. And behaviour, we thought, was really the key to what was going on. What was Giganto doing at the time? Well, how on earth <laughs> can you deduce that just from a couple of uh, couple of teeth and jawbones? Yeah, so teeth. Teeth are pretty amazing. They're like a, a wealth of information that you can get from teeth. What was it eating? What do we know about its diet from yeah, the teeth? Yeah, so we know that it's from looking at um, what we call DMTA analysis, just looking at the texture of the teeth, you can look at how many pits and scratches there are on the teeth and kind of work out what it was eating. So early Giganto liked to eat fruit. That was its number one preference. 
But when we start to shift 700 to 600,000, we start to see a shift towards wetter and drier periods. Now, during the wet periods, obviously, lots of fruit. But during the drier periods, there's no fruit around. So what does Giganto eat when there's no fruit around? Um, and Giganto, its choice of fallback food was one of its reasons for its demise. So it chose a very fibrous um, fallback food. So things like bark off the sides of trees or twigs that it's finding on the floor. God, so, there's zero u- nutrition in I those know, things, isn't there? <laughs> and, yeah, sorry, and, you, and you can tell that by the kind of scoring that's yeah. on the on so the So very, very different uh, texture on the teeth in the early Giganto compared to Giganto we found around the extinction time. Did it, did it eat meat at all? No, it's definitely vegetarian. Yeah. Man, it would have had to have eaten a lot of vegetation then yes. in order to stay alive. A big, big creature would have to like chew up half the jungle up before yeah, in order so, to stay alive. So that's like this evolutionary choice that it makes. It decides to be big. It decides to go on the evolutionary path of just eating a lot of food, but probably not such high nutrition value um, compared to other sort of primates or other, uh, other mammals that choose to have higher quality food, but less of it. If it's not a carnivore, what's the advantage in being big? Um, it's to access that that food source that I'm talking about. Oh, it so can reach higher. For it can the reach higher, higher and it can eat bigger things because it's got a bigger jaw and bigger teeth. So if you think about um, an elephant on the African plains, it can pretty much eat a whole tree. It can eat everything. It just goes for it and just eats as much as it can. Whereas you compare that to a gazelle, gazelle can't eat big things. It can't eat loads and loads of food. So it goes for the high quality little grass shoots and roots that it finds on the floor. So. It's like an evolutionary path that it chose, which was fantastic at two million years ago when there's dense forest. Um, but what we found at you know 700, 600, this this key time when we start to see the strengthening of the seasons, is that suddenly we're going through these dry periods, and it can't get the fruit and it can't you know access the same kind of um, vegetation and um, resources that an orangutan can. Because remember, orangutans are in the top canopy. So they have oh. access to so much more options. So their fallback food was much more nutritious. So they were going for flowers in the top of the, the canopy. They were going for little shoots, um, sometimes um, nuts and seeds. Sometimes they'd eat insects, sometimes even small mammals. So they had a, a choice and they could forage much, much further distances because they're in the upper, upper canopy and they can swing between branches um, and find all the food. But Giganto can't. No. Giganto can reach high, can but reach it can't high. climb. High. And it can't forage very large distances. It's just too big. So suddenly it's restricted to a much smaller zone and it's it's just eating bark off trees. <laughs> um, and it's, Poor Giganto. I know. <laughs> That's not having, not having a very good not time. It's been eating time. delicious fruit and it's got to go to bark instead. <laughs> yeah. And it must yeah. be getting weaker and weaker. So yeah. what are we... So, so then you think now that the reason why it became extinct was because the climate changed and... Seasons were introduced to that part of the world. The change that meant that there was less fruit, less food, so these yeah. poor old apes are eating uh, bark and twigs in- instead. Yeah. So, do we start to see it, it reduce in size at this point? No, no. So, we don't see it reduce in size. We d- see it reducing in numbers. So, if you look at early giganto caves, we're getting hundreds and hundreds of giganto teeth. And then, when you look at the younger caves, around 300,000, we're getting two or three giganto teeth. So, the numbers are coming down, definitely dwindling. Um, but it's not shrinking. No, it's not shrinking. Because it, it's a long way down the road of being big then. Is that, it's is that a long why? way down. It's committed. It's fully committed to its evolutionary path. It can't change now. And what we actually see is this transition period from about 600,000 until it goes extinct, we actually see it gaining in size. It's actually getting bigger, which just accentuates wow. all of its problems. So what's happening to these apes as time goes by? They're, they're eating more and more bark in these off seasons. They're getting thinner, I, I presume. Their nutrition is getting poorer. There's some of them are starving to death. They're less likely to reproduce, and they're yep. just starting to disappear from the forest. Starting to dwindle, yeah, and that's what we're seeing. And we did a trace element analysis on the teeth. So again, going back to teeth, so much information in teeth. Um, and we, if you cut the teeth in half and have a look at how trace elements such as barium and strontium and calcium are laid down in the teeth, it really gives you clues as to how they were behaving and how they were surviving. So early Giganto, we see this lovely strong banding um, in in the trace elements shows, you know, wide diversity of food and really thriving. And then we look at the younger giganta very close to extinction. Um, 
the trace elements are still there, but it's very diffuse and very um, almost blurred. There's no strong banding and it's showing less diversity in food and it's also showing chronic stress in the population. So we're talking generational stress um, that's being passed down to all its offspring. Um, Can you tell us something about breastfeeding as a result of this kind of data from the teeth? Yeah, so breastfeeding is is the next step that we're looking at. But what we suspect is that um, the breastfeeding would have really reduced during this time. Again, you can tell that from the teeth, which is incredible. Um, And we can tell like how long they were breastfeeding for. So I think if we compare with early Giganto compared to Giganto extinction, we will see a massive change in the breastfeeding. Do they breastfeed for longer than humans? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, so so primates generally do uh, like take longer um, th- than humans, but um, as to what Giganto did exactly, it's still unknown. Like, even just looking at the trace elements in teeth is a new thing for, for Giganthopithecus research. So at the moment, we're sort of unsure as to where it is, but definitely this research is is progressing at the moment. So I'm just astonished by that there's this universe of information in these yeah. incredibly ancient teeth and a bit of a jawbone, in the teeth in particular, given that 1935 it was being sold as a dragon's tooth. And yeah. now we, you're able to tell me a story about an ape that was probably three metres high and that lived like this, had sat on the jungle floor, wasn't able to climb, it ate low-hanging or higher-hanging fruit yeah. as it was and then got into terrible trouble and ate bark when, yeah. when the seasons changed. Yeah. Is the from th- teeth. I mean, it's crazy. I know it? it is crazy. Do we, do we assume that all kinds of... Other sciences are on the way that will be able to extract even more information from such things. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, it's it's developing such a, a rate that's in, crazy. I mean, 10 years ago when I first started uh, looking at this stuff, the, the dating wasn't at the point where I could actually use it in China. But now we've developed the techniques in these, you know, sort of high rate activity um, um, landscapes and I can actually use dating techniques I couldn't use 10 years ago. So it's it's developing at an amazing rate. And people say to me, oh, but you know, the information from teeth is great, but really you don't really know until you get postcranial. And I say, yeah, but until we get postcranial, this is this is a helps us really understand to yeah, sort of fill in some of the gaps, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure is. You were saying you were looking at pollen samples that were found in the sediment around where yeah. these fossils were found. What were they telling you about how the environment changed? I mean, you're saying there were seasons, but what did that actually yeah. mean for the landscape around them? Yeah, so early Giganto, um, we're seeing lots of species of plant that suggest a dense forest, um, but we're also seeing uh, grassland, so it's been a bit of a mosaic landscape. Um, and then then we start to see sort of um, pollen taxa coming in, about 600,000, that indicates that there was a change. So we're not talking deterioration of forests, um, but there was definitely a change in the plant communities. And we're starting to see um, plants coming in, which we call disturbance taxa. So these are the sort of plants that come in um, when there's been a change due to the environment. Like weeds, essentially. Yeah. I mean, like, weed um, is just an unwanted plant, isn't yeah, it? Or, yeah, or exactly. Or an invasive species. And so ferns was a, a definitely, we start to see the introduction of ferns and things. And they ferns tend to come in when there's, you know, some sort of change in the environment. Definitely around 200,000, we see a massive surge of ferns. But earlier, like around gigantic extinction time, we just seen this disturbance taxa coming in. And we know that there's a big change. But it's at this point, it's only a change in the plant communities. It's not a breakdown of the forest. So that's an important point because that's what people always have attributed its extinction to previously. So there's still so much we don't know about this giant ape. As you say, we don't know what it looked like. We don't know what its features were, what its hair was like, and so many other things as well. But we do know all this other stuff, uh, thanks to the work you and your colleagues have been doing. All of this tells you then that these were giant apes that just couldn't adjust to keep pace with the changing environment. Exactly right. Yeah. What are some of the implications this has, this might have for us now? Yeah, so I think this is incredibly important. Um, some people say to me, oh, but, you know, it's 300,000 years ago. Why do we worry about things like that? And I'm like, well, if you look at our modern-day orangutans and our modern-day mountain gorillas, they're all under threat. Um, and, and there's so much we don't know about primate extinction. And the way the world is going at the moment, we could be faced with what we call a sixth mass extinction event. In the geological past, we've had five mass extinction events where all of the fauna just gets wiped out. And the way that we're going at the moment with climate change, we could be facing that. So it really puts a precedent on understanding extinction and understanding how these kind of environmental stresses affect primates. And 
one thing I like to do is to go back to previous extinctions that were unexplained. So, you know, I had a look at um, Homo erectus in, in Nangdong, like why did they go extinct? Um, and, and now obviously Gigantopithecus blackie. So just looking at how primates respond to these environmental stresses really helps us to understand, you know, which primates are more resilient, um, which primates are more vulnerable. And, and we're finding that primates that have this specialist um, adaption to habitats and food are definitely much more vulnerable than the generalists. So orangutans are definitely a generalist. They, they're much more what we call agile adapters. You know, they can adapt w- where they live, the habitat. They were quite happy to move into more open forested environments, whereas Giganto definitely stayed in, in very enclosed environments, even during these changes. So orangutans are much more agile. They're much more able to adapt to the changes that occurred, and they were obviously much more successful. So this really has implications for modern day orangutans, which we know are a bit more generalist and and probably could survive um, even in environmental changes. But a mountain gorilla, as we know, are much more specialist. So we need to really watch these these types of species for problems in the future. So primates are either generalists or specialists. It would seem, I suppose, humans are the ultimate generalists. Is is that true to say? Yeah, very, very, very adaptable. I mean, we're sort of learning already that, you know, we thought that humans are very good at living in coastal areas, but now we're finding, you know, from earlier evidence that they were living in upland areas, they were living inland, they weren't just living at the coast, they could survive in deserted environments, um, rainforests, you know, um, really, really good at adapting to different uh, scenarios and situations. And then as soon as we, we have technology, we start building boats and we go out to the ocean to fish, we do yeah. all sorts of other things as well, yeah. create spears to help us hunt much larger mammals on, on the landscape. So humans are the ultimate ultimate generalists. Yeah, definitely. So are you continuing your research into this this creature at the moment? You've been at it for, what, nine years now or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time. We haven't been back to China since 2019. So this year we're planning a big trip to go back. Um, obviously, my colleague in China has been working the whole time. You know, he's having all the fun of the field work. We're just doing the analysis. So <laughs> so I'd like to get back in the field and, and have a look. And I mean, the hunt's still on. I mean, we, we are so determined to find you know, post-cranial evidence. Um, And I think that we've really sort of honed our cave finding techniques. And um, when I joined the team, um, Yingqi hadn't found a new Giganto cave in in about 10 years. And then we joined and for this paper, we had to sort of cut off the evidence at one point. Otherwise, there's just too many caves. And he found another six Giganto caves after that. So there's another six that we haven't even, you know, we know they're older, but you know, just another load of evidence. And I just think if we keep going at this rate, we, we, we have a good chance of finding postcranial. So, Will you come on the show again if you find this Definitely. holy grail, this, a giant <laughs> leg bone or a shoulder bone or a rib, uh, something, a rib huge. Or something huge? Yeah, I mean, it'd be pretty amazing. Definitely. <laughs> Kira, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you and thank you so much. Thank you. been listening to a podcast of conversations with Richard Feidler. For more conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.